Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first panel discussion of this year's BTO virtual conference. Uh, we're really sorry that this year the pandemic means we're unable to meet you face to face in person. Uh, but I'm also really hopeful that as a result of doing this online for the first time, uh, many more of you who wouldn't normally be able to come to our uh, annual conference at Swanwick uh, can do so this year um, in this virtual environment. And whether you're a regular conference attendee or this is your first one, uh, I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to you. My name's Yayan Evans. I am BTO's Director of Engagement. Um, you might recognize my name from the emails that I send out, um, even if you don't recognize the pronunciation of it. Uh, I hope that tonight you've learned something at least. Uh, I'm going to be one of your hosts uh, this evening for what promises to be a really interesting evening, I think. Uh, this week, we've organized uh, about 14 talks and two different panel sessions, uh, all of which are free to attend. And we've only been able to do this uh, because of the support of our members. Uh, income from memberships and donations make up almost half of, of our charity's uh, total income. And without the support of our members, BTO just wouldn't be the organization it is today. This is a tough time for many people and for many different reasons. Uh, for charities like ours, the future is, is uncertain and our income is really suffering because of the pandemic. If you're in a position to make a donation to support our work, we'd be really grateful. Uh, our current appeal is actually aimed at raising funds to support our youth engagement work. And so if you're inspired by what you hear this evening, uh, you can help by donating at the uh, special conference link, which you can see on the screen uh, just now. Also, if you enjoyed today's talks and uh, tonight's uh, panel and you feel like the BTO is an organisation you'd like to support, uh, we'd love you to join as a member if you're not a member already. Our members are the lifeblood of the BTO and it's through uh, the support of members that we can inspire and educate people and also advance our collective knowledge and understanding of birds through research. I'm delighted to say we've got six brilliant young people lined up to contribute to our discussion tonight. Uh, five from our own youth advisory panel and uh, an ambassador from Action, to Conservation, from Action for Conservation. I'm delighted also to say that Emma Schofield will chair the panel discussion. Uh, Emma works for the brilliant Action for Conservation organisation who we've, we've collaborated with on a number of different initiatives and projects over the last few years. Uh, Emma's their Northwest Programme Manager and she'll tell you a bit more about Action Co for Conservation shortly. Uh, feel free to pose any questions you've got for the panel through the uh, question, and answer, question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if when you're in there you spot any questions that you like the look of and would like to ask too, uh, give them a thumbs up and that'll push them up the charts to make sure that they uh, get answered at the end. We're going to start with a short introduction to our youth advisory panel and the work that they've been doing together, uh, followed by an introduction from Emma about Action for Conservation, and then we'll bring in our panellists. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce um, Sorrel Lyle. She's part of our youth advisory panel, and she's going to tell us about the work that they've been doing uh, together. So I'll introduce uh, Sorrel and ask her to come on in. Thanks, Yayan. Um, hopefully you can see that. So uh, I'm Sorrel, I've um, been part of the Youth Advisory Panel since uh, it began in January. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about what we've been up to over the past year uh, and sort of our plans going forward. So firstly, uh, who is the Youth Advisory Panel? Well, we're a group of 10 young people aged 16 to 25 from around the UK and you can see our faces here. Uh, we work closely with the BTO staff, um, mainly at the nunnery in Thetford, to develop the BTO's youth engagement strategy. Um, and this strategy is mainly for older young people, so 16 to 25, um, as we feel this is an age group that has fewer opportunities and activities compared to several charities that um, engage and educate younger children. Um, so we had our first meeting back in January, which seems like ages ago now. Uh, and one of our first priorities was developing our youth engagement vision. And we came up with this. A diverse, vibrant community of young birders supported by BTO with accessible youth-led opportunities, inspiring young people to engage with nature and science. Sorrel, and we... can you Sorry? just share your screen? Oh, I thought I was. I apologize. That's okay. 
That's the one. There we go. Should I start again? <laughs> I'll show you our faces. <laughs> Apologize, I thought I'd uh, press the button there. Is that working? Excellent, sorry. Um, so yes, this is us, the Youth Advisory Panel. Um, I'll go back to our vision. So um, yeah, we feel like this vision really encompasses our goals uh, with the youth engagement strategy um, and diversity and inclusivity is really at the heart of what we want to do. And actually it's really nice looking back on our vision now after we've started to implement some of our ideas and see how we've uh, seen this vision through. So after we came up with this, the next steps were to research uh, successful youth, nat youth nature engagement um, and start bouncing ideas off each other, uh, drawing from our own experiences in schools, in universities, in local bird clubs and more. So we decided to conduct a survey to gather the opinions of uh, young people on youth engagement and birding. And uh, we produced an infographic, which the next few slides are taken from, and you might have seen that on uh, BTO social media a few months ago. So we had 230 young people respond and we asked what barriers uh, felt they felt prevented them from accessing birding. And this was really pivotal to our early discussions in YAP and what we built our ideas from. So the main barrier was travel uh, with many young people feeling that opportunities or uh, nature reserves are out of their reach without their own transport. Uh, not having transport, lack of opportunities in my area. There are some of the quotes from the survey. Another barrier was not having enough time amongst a busy education schedule and other commitments. Another was uh, money, the cost of events, training, equipment, binoculars are expensive and often young people have other priorities for their money. And also confidence, um, attending a birding event and not knowing anyone, thinking you're gonna be the only young person there, it's daunting and it puts off a lot of people from uh, getting involved in opportunities. So we then asked what suggestions uh, young people felt they had for uh, youth engagement. So our top ideas were uh, working with schools, social media and online content specifically for youth, local accessible events and advice for a career in conservation. So from uh, these barriers and these ideas, we came up with five main ideas to develop further. And these are an ambassador scheme, support for schools and universities, training, regional groups and online content. And our youth representative scheme, which we're gonna talk about next, encompasses four of these ideas of an ambassador scheme, supporting schools and universities, training, and uh, establishing regional groups. So our youth representative scheme is all about hands-on, on the ground engagement um, with events for young people, organized and run by young people. So the role of a youth rep will be to uh, liaise with their local birding groups, the local ringing groups and their BTO regional representatives to organise activities and events to engage other young people in birding in their area. And also to connect with local schools and universities to provide these opportunities and bring events to young people, making them more accessible. So we've just recruited the youth reps for our pilot scheme and the recruitment process was run by uh, YAP and BTO staff. The plan was to uh, recruit 10 representatives across the country and because of the, the strength of the applicants, we uh, ended up recruiting 15 youth reps in 12 different locations, uh, including Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And as this is a pilot, uh, we're testing how the program will work with teams of young people in some areas and then uh, youth reps working um, independently in other areas. So, for example, we've got a team of three down in Exeter and a team of two in Shropshire. Uh, so we're excited to see how that will work. Um, the youth reps will work closely with the app. They'll have an associated YAP member to provide um, contact and, and to bounce ideas off. And uh, we've just had our first meeting actually with the youth reps um, last weekend, starting to discuss ideas and partnering the youth reps with their BTO regional rep to start seeing how these ideas can, can happen. Um, so ideas and uh, plans will come into place in January. So at the moment, it's just sort of planning and get, getting to know each other. And then the pilot scheme will run for the next year and then we're looking to expand the scheme building on what we learned in this pilot um and yeah it's really exciting this idea has been in the works for a few months now and uh, it's finally happening and it's really it's really exciting so another priority for us is uh setting up a youth section on the bto website um, as a hub of resources for young people and this will include uh, training videos and quizzes and also content made by young birders like vlogs and blogs to give a platform um, for the voices of young birders. 
Uh, we also want to provide resources on mindfulness and birding, uh, as this is something we're really keen to promote among, amongst young people. Uh, we think it will help to engage a wider group uh, of young people to see their mental health benefits of nature and birds. And lastly, uh, we have an equipment donation scheme in the works, as one of the key barriers we've found uh, for young people is equipment. Um, as everyone knows, binoculars are pretty expensive. So we're in the process of setting up an equipment donation scheme where people can send in their old bins and equipment and we'll redistribute these as part of starter packs for schools and university groups. And this, these will be distributed via the youth reps and the links they make with their local schools and universities. We also have plans for sponsorship by an optics company to provide binoculars, which is really exciting. So, and we're hoping this will encourage uh, schools to take part in surveys like the Great, Fish, uh, the Great, sorry, um, the Garden Bird Watch Survey, um, which would be a great way for more young people to contribute to bird science. So, this is what YAP has been up to over the past year. Uh, we've had many discussions, lots of ideas flown around, and it's great that we're start starting to see these things through now. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, and back to Yayan. Thanks, Sorrel. That was a great overview. Just want to say that, um, you know, Sorrel and the other panelists have given their time and insight so generously this year. And we've worked so hard together. Um, just this weekend, actually, we spent uh, two hours together on the Saturday and four hours together on Sunday afternoon, uh, getting ready for our new uh, youth reps. And um, it's not just a bunch of ideas that these guys have produced, it's also an actual uh, a full strategy that uh, we're incredibly proud of and that they're going to be presenting to the BTO board on Friday uh, of this week. So um, we're so proud of that and uh, so grateful for all the input they've given us. And more than anything, I think what I've got out of the whole process is just how much fun um, it's been to work with them all. You know, as, as staff, we've kind of sometimes had these meetings at the end of the day when um, we probably thought we would prefer to be doing something else, but actually the energy and enthusiasm of this group has always um, revitalized us all and inspired us all. So it's been a, a privilege to do. Uh, next, I'm going to invite Emma to introduce us to Action for Conservation and the fantastic work that they do to engage uh, young people. Um, Emma, over to you. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. <laughs> um, so I'm Emma and I am from uh, an organisation called Action for Conservation. I work in the northwest of England. I'm really excited to be here today to have been invited by BTO to chair the panel today. Um, we love working with them and we've been able to collaborate on quite a few of our programmes in the past. Um, I was super impressed with what Sorrel um, has just been talking about with the YAP and how, um, what work they've been doing. I think it's really important um, and we'll look a bit more at that when we do our questions on the panel too. Um, so I'm here today, we've also got an, a representative from Action for Conservation called Vinny, so I'll let him introduce himself after this, um, along with the rest of the panel. So just a really quick interlude as to what Action for Conservation is about, so you have a bit of a, a background on ourselves. Um, we're a UK environmental education charity it works with young people 12 to 18 to inspire the next generation of environmental leaders. So to us being a conservationist isn't just following a career as a field biologist or a campaigner. We believe that it's a passion for conservation and it can flow through anyone's life, whatever their background. Um, so we aim to inspire today's young people into our long term belief in the wonder of the natural world, which will shape their dreams and actions, whichever um, path their lives take. And these are our vision, mission and values, just for you guys to sort of have a read through. Um, so why was Action for Conservation formed? So the importance of our mission that was on the last page, which was to bring the magic of nature into young people's lives, inspiring a youth movement committed to conservation and to the earth. It's basically highlighted in these statistics with such high proportions of young people feeling an in, in, inadequate connection to nature. And we also recognise that the climate and ecological crisis disproportionately impacts minority and marginalised communities. Yet these voices are largely underrepresented in the sector. Um, to deliver climate justice and halt the ecological crisis, we urgently need an inclusive environmental movement. So what do we actually do? <laughs> we have a few strands of our programmes. In the top corner, you can see an image from our Dragon's Den event, which is the final event for our school's programme um, called Wild Ed. Um, and it's all about educating students about environmental issues and inspiring them to take action. 
and we support them to complete that action over a school term. Um, in the next picture next to it, you can see um, our summer camps um, and they're really to connect with nature, learn about the local environmental issues and solutions. This is where we've worked BTO quite closely. Um, we arrange for the campus to meet with a local bird ringing group um, and they talk about, they learn about the processes and they see the birds up close and we've had consistent feedback that's absolutely their favourite activity from the campus and has inspired many of them to continue to, to learn more about the birding world and it's one of my favourite activities as well. Um, our campus also go on to become AFC ambassadors which is what Vinny is and um, so Vinny joined us on a camp and now he's one of our ambassadors and they get the opportunity to continue expanding their knowledge and um, the pledges that they make at the end of camp in their local areas with the support from Action for Conservation um, with many different opportunities like today we connected Vinny with this opportunity so it's not the chance to get out get young voices out um, into different spaces um, another very exciting opportunity at the bottom is one that we launched last year it's called the pen pump project and this is the world's biggest youth-led restoration project and is based in wales in the brecon beacons it's the first project of its kind and it aims to reverse or well, to go towards reversing devastating ecological breakdown and create a, gro a global gold standard for youth-led environmental action it's really exciting if you get the chance to give it a search and um, lastly with the recent restrictions that meant we were unable to deliver anything in person um, for a while, we wanted to continue to connect with the people that we work with, um, and not just in the UK, but we managed to sort of reach out globally as well with our digital programme called Wild Web. Um, it's a programme that anyone between the ages of 13 to 17 can join. We explore a new topic each Wild Web cycle and look at how it impacts our planet and how we can take action. Anyone can join as long as you're the right age bracket. So check it out online. Um, so that's basically Action for Conservation in a nutshell. Another massive thank you to BTO for having me here today. Um, and I'm gonna pass over to the other panel members to introduce themselves. I think we're gonna do this alphabetically. Um, so we're gonna pass over to Arjun. Um, if you wanna introduce yourselves and then we can, maybe you can pass it along to the next person in the alphabet. So I was just trying to put my camera on. Yeah, it doesn't seem like my camera's working, but uh, hi everyone, I'm Arjun. I'm 17 and I'm based in South London. Uh, I'm currently in my last year of A-levels and I've had basically a lifelong passion for nature. Uh, I'd say bird watching specifically. I got interested in when I was around seven or eight um, and since then I've become hooked. So I've, I'm involved with all sorts of things now, as well as the BTO. I'm lucky enough to have an involvement with the Cameron Bespoke Trust, who are a, young, uh, a group of young people working with similar aims to the BTO, but uh, almost directly try to organise walks, for example, for nature. Uh, as well as that, I'm involved with environmental campaigning uh, for what's now just finished as the I Will campaign. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'll pass that on to Sorrel next, I think. Hi again. Uh, yeah, so I'm Sorrel. I'm 22. I'm from Nottingham, but currently studying ecology um, in Edinburgh, uh, where I'm helping to run the University Bird Sock that we set up about a year ago. Uh, so that's me. Um, I'm not sure I go in alphabetical order, so I'm going to pass to Ellie. Thanks, Sorrel. Um, I don't think I can start my video either, um, but I'll carry on anyway. Um, so my name's Ellie, I'm also on YAP. I'm 18 as well. Um, I'm my last year of A-level, same as Arjun. And I've also got a basis of a love for birding, but I've also branched into wildlife gardening and set up a wildlife gardening club at school. So I've also had connections um, with the RHS and the Karen Bespoke Trust from that. So that's me, and I'd like to pass on to Matt next, I think. Hello. I think I'm working. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm 21. I'm from Essex. Uh, you might have seen me hanging around Titchwell quite a lot. 
Um, I worked for the RSPB at Neen Washes and Titchwell over the summer and autumn. I've just moved back and doing some work for my dad over the winter. Um, I'm an absolute bird mad. I'm a bird watcher, obviously part of the BTL Youth Advisory Panel. And I've done a couple of other things. I'm really passionate about trying to get more young people like me into nature and conservation. And I'll pass it on to, I'm not sure who, so someone just take the one second. Oh, someone else, Sam. Sam, you're getting it next. We can't hear you, Sam. I must have unmuted myself and then muted myself again. Did that work? Yeah, you're well, good now. Perfect. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Samuel. I'm currently studying at Bournemouth University, um, studying ecology and wildlife conservation. Um, I'm a part of the BTO Youth Advisory Panel as well. And um, I've also lucky enough to uh, be uh, an ambassador for the Cameron Bespoker Trust. And um, yeah, I, I um, yeah, so um, I think I'm going to pass on to Vinny. Hi, I'm Vinny and I'm based in Southwest England and um, I'm 14 years old and ever since, well, as long as I can remember, I've been interested in birding and bird watching. And um, obviously, as I grow older, I hope I kind of do more stuff like um, um, I participated in um, the Action for Conservation um, one of their summer camps, which you might already know of. Um, and yeah, I just hope to do more. And I don't know who to pass it on to because I'm not really sure um, who's after my name. I'm I think not so. sure. Everybody, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. All right, thank you very much. Um, if this is everyone that's on the panel today and we're gonna get the opportunity to um, ask some questions and I've got some questions for you guys and um, if anyone wants to ask any questions to the panel please pop them in the question and answer box at the bottom um, or if you see a question that you really like if you just give it a thumbs up and it will it will go up in the in the list of questions for us to to look at but first off we're going to start with a quick fire round and um, so for the panelist if you really really want to answer first just give me a wave pop your thumbs up otherwise I'll get around to everybody so quick fire round and um, we'd really like to know what everyone's favorite bird species is and why um, I'm going to throw that out to Sam um, so my favorite bird species is the kingfisher um, partially just because they're the thing that one of the things that helped to get me involved with uh, birding and uh, wildlife in general. Um, I've, not being able to see one for so long sort of inspired my interest. So, yeah. Great answer. Next, I'm going to go to Ellie. What is your favourite bird species and why? Um, it's quite a hard question, to be honest. It's hard to pick just one. Um, but I'd probably have to say the black grouse because um, they show an amazing leopard display and I really look forward to going to see it with my mum and my dad every year in Wales. So it's definitely a highlight for me. Incredible. I'm going to throw that over to Vinny. Um, my favourite bird species would probably be the kestrel because um, you can see them practically anywhere in England. Um, they're very widespread. And they also have beautiful, beautiful plumage as well. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, Sorrel, how about you? I think I'd have to go with the bullfinch just because they're just good. They're, they've got great plumage and, and I love their call. And then up here in Edinburgh, we hear them quite a lot, which is really nice because not, not used to seeing them all that often back home. So, yeah. I like that. They're just good. Like no other reason. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> uh, Arjun, how about yourself? Mine would be probably the sound of the summer with swifts. I think every year when I get them back, it's just the best time of year when I'm outdoors every day playing cricket, just and being able to stand at home and, and challenge myself to get pictures of them. So yeah, swifts mm -hmm. for me. Sounds like they come with a nice memory. And Matt. 
Uh, well, I always say I wouldn't have a favourite bird species. Probably the one that I want to see next, given the wind conditions and everything like that. Um, so I'll go with white-fronted geese, because in the last couple of days, we've broken the Holland Haven record with the large eruption, eruption that's come from the continent in the last few days of 122. So that's my favourite at the moment. <laughs> Fab. OK, thank you for the quick fire round. Um, next sort of... A uh, similar quick fire round question. What got you interested in bird watching and conservation in general? Um, I'm going to go to Arjun. Uh, so I think my trigger was a big garden bird watch initially. So that's something that the RSP we do every year and that got me involved. But what got me more involved, I guess, just from something which was a small hobby to something that was a proper passion was visiting Malaysia in 2015 and being able to see species there it kind of triggered a new level of interest being able to wake up the hornbills in your little garden just yeah it just blew my mind and I think ever since then I've become hooked I, I can't really get out of it now. And what age were you when you first did the the garden watch? Bit? So I first got involved when I was seven or eight uh, I can't remember then but that was a long time ago uh, and yeah ever, ever since then it's just grown year on year and now it's something that's just a passion that I know I'll take up again more in the future. Incredible. Uh, Sorrel, how about you? So I got into it through my grandparents. They've been birding for years and kind of accidentally got me into it as well. Um, and yeah, just kind of spending time in nature, just grew more into it. Then I learned about uh, ecology as a career, um, kind of didn't realise it was a career for a long time. And then I think I was 16 when I realised, I was like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to study. And then started getting a lot more serious about it. Fab. And where did you learn about ecology as a career? That was at school and that was completely by chance, actually. Um, so I think it kind of shows the value of, uh, of spreading the ecology word and the birding word amongst more people. Uh, Matt, how about yourself? Yeah, so I'm back to geese. So when I was about eight or nine years old, um, I remember kicking up a stink, having to go for a walk on what's now my local patch in, like, in the winter. Uh, and I had a one and a half thousand Brent geese, which sort of circled around me head and dropped into the scrape. And I went back there to see him a few more times. And I've been back there almost every day since. <laughs> uh, Samuel, how about you? So for me, it was um, the one of the first times that I'd like properly visited the countryside. Uh, my great aunt took me out when I was about eight to a little town in uh, Nottinghamshire and uh, effectively there was nothing else to do but um, look at birds there which I am very grateful for because that's where it's brought me uh, well it's brought me to here today and um, it involves this notebook here which is I just happen to have sitting next to me that wasn't planned at all it's just on my desk but that's my first ever notebook which um, she gave me to record um, the species in that I saw thereafter so yeah I, that's how I got involved. It looks like a well-used and loved notebook. So that's very nice to see. <laughs> uh, Vinny, what about yourself? Ooh, Sorry about that. <laughs> <It's okay>. um, <laughs> it kind of just started at a very young age, as in kind of primary school, when kind of small things just fueled that passion for loving birds, like the um, the bird watch that. I think the B2 runs every year. Um, it just um, kind of hooked me in from the start and just the country, go, going around like the countryside areas and stuff and just seeing birds of prey kind of circling in the sky. Um, it's just beautiful, really. And that's how I got interested. Fab. And I think it's just Ellie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I kind of started by... Um, the walk and I, my family does a lot of hiking. We're trying to do all the peaks in England and Wales, which takes me to some <laughs> very remote places. So I kind of got introduced to nature through then, but I only really got seriously kind of into birding when I first went along to one of the BTO events. So the BTO bird camp back in 2017, I want to say. <laughs> and that kind of really um, exposed me to other really inspiring young people who also doing amazing things, blogs, campaigning, all these surveys, and I, which I hadn't been introduced to before. So that kind of led me on to kind of get more involved and set up my wildlife garden club at school. Amazing. I think there's definitely a theme of 
sort of family and being quite from a young age having it introduced um, so that's really nice to sort of hear from everyone um, so we're going to jump into the next question um, how well do you all think that environmental organi organizations engage young people um, so does anyone want to sort of take that first yeah Matt go for it Yeah, so I think what I'd say is, is I think they're doing their best and I think they're doing okay, but I think there's always room to do better. I think there's room to inspire more people, you know. I think the amount of birders and conservationists out of the amount of young people in Britain is such a small percentage for something that I think is so enjoyable and a sort of world of its own. That, And I think that's why we're all here. Isn't that, is, that not, is that not why... We're here sort of while well, we're volunteers for the BTO and while well, I've worked for the RSPB, et cetera, and I've, like we've all done, is to try and make a difference and try and get more people involved. Um, you know, there's great stuff like the BTO do bird camp, they're doing the advisory panel, we've got the youth reps, you know, there's all these branches that we're trying to do better in. There's always room to improve, you know. I would love to see birding be a something that's normal, like going to play football, because I love it. And I and I say to all my mates, I think we've just got to normalise it of in the within the community, within, within the country, because everyone can enjoy it. You can literally look outside your door, no matter where you are, and see stuff and act on and encourage more things into your garden. Um, so everyone can get involved. Hmm. Sort of adding on to that, Matt, and I'll sort of ask the same question to everyone else. Do you have any other suggestions that organisations can do better? Um, obviously, you've, you've listed some great ones that you're doing at BTO. Is there any other suggestions that you'd make to other organisations that would love to engage young people um, but might be struggling? Um, I think it's difficult because I think to you have to get people outside. So whether that be that um, when we were at Chitra, we did free, um, free family Fridays. So families could come along to the reserve and get in for free. And that was always unbelievable. You'd go out there and you'd walk around and there were so many families coming in. You know, cost can, can be a barrier even if it's not that the people can't afford to go to the places, which is the case in some cases, but just to encourage people to go there because it's like a sale in a shop. They're trying to draw you in. We've got to draw people into the outdoors. So dropping them costs, um, letting people in, doing events, doing walks. We've got to get them outside. You know, you're not going to get inspired from nature and conservation by sitting inside and looking at a TV screen. So getting them outside, I think. Yeah. Fab. Um, and Arjun, you've got your hand up. Um, what would you like to add to, to that and answer that question? Yeah, so I was just saying, I think what, uh, what Matt said was really, really uh, good. And I think I agree with basically everything there. And linking back to some of my own experiences as well, is uh, I got involved with conservation specifically uh, through the National Trust in 2018. Uh, and that was because of Duke of Edinburgh. So Duke of Edinburgh is such a great way because uh, you have compulsory six months of volunteering I think to start with uh, and I wanted to be outdoors regardless I was good I was going to make sure it was in a park and it just so happened that the National Trust near me uh, had a young uh, young rangers program going on there uh, which is for 11 to 24 year olds but they've only got six across all their sites across the UK and that's because of there being very the amount of funding available for them for something like that is very very low so while it's very very hard I think getting young people involved in decision making and some of the events that they run because everywhere has events whether it's involved with nature or not whether it's just kind of indirectly in the environment just in a local park i think getting people involved like that is so good because it gives people experiences uh, that by the time they're 18 19 most young people don't have that's great and how did you hear about the the ranger opportunity what what how would you look out for something like that <laughs> Well, I mean, I've always just, I always went to that day, uh, to, so my patch is Morgan Hall Park, and I've always been there anyway for photography, for bird watching in general, uh, and it was, I just basically went on their website and searched up volunteering there, and there were so many different things, and what was lucky is that there were uh, specifically for young people a programme, but at the same time, I think so many places would take on young people as volunteers, so almost looking, going to places and asking people, almost taking that first step to see the one to look for it rather than almost just you just wait for it to appear to you I think that's really good as well Fat. and we've got another hand up Sam yeah I was, what I was going to say is that um, I don't think any of the yappers would be here today if we didn't think that some of the sort of if some of the 
the way organizations sort of get people engaged with young people was perfect if that makes sense because we're here to try and make that change and to try and help the bto better engage with young people so um there's obviously i guess what i'm trying to say is that there are there are things that need to be improved obviously there's there's existing things like bto bird camp for, with the bto perspective that um are are um helping and definitely especially in ellie's case helping them helping young people to get involved with bird watching but uh, there is more that needs to be done mm. fab um i'm gonna if no one else has a hands up i might just pass over to Vinny. um i guess as a reminder of the question um how well do we think environmental organizations engage young people um i think that obviously they're doing well they're reaching kind of so many people but um which is why there's been kind of participants here and the um, youth advisory panel, which is here also, which has gotten through kind of that people engaging other people. Um, but there is room for improvement, obviously. And I think one way to do it would be, um, as well as what the other people have said, um, kind of reaching people through social media where people kind of, uh, most active because it will give them a better chance to see it and kind of be interested yeah I think that's really interesting about social media obviously there's lots of different types of social media the question for you guys is which social media where where are are the right platforms to be connecting with you on um I saw Ellie nodding so maybe Ellie you want to you want to add into that um, I know a big um, platform for birders is Twitter, but also you can't just stick to the same um, kind of route. So I think you do need to branch out to, um, to like Instagram and maybe Facebook. I think TikTok is a bit step too far <laughs> potentially, um, but it's definitely on the cards for some people. But I definitely agree with Vinny, the fact that we need more representation in media to normalise it so people can associate and see um, people birding and be like I'm I'm like them I can get involved with this because you need to have more um, representation in the media and show that it is kind of a younger image of birding is kind of developing but I think from that a lot of um, organizations are perhaps focused on engaging um, primary school people before and perhaps a lot younger audience but I suppose to an extent um, once you go into secondary school there's a lot more social pressures on the whole um, ideas of being cool culturally in the norm all of that and I feel like um, there needs to be a continuation more so um, and that support and engagement as you progress into more the teen years and I suppose that's where YAP and the youth reps are really coming through and especially I know your um your camps as well more engaging the teen years because that's although it's amazing to engage them while they're young you've got the risk that they're going to drop off when they go into secondary school and it needs to be that follow-through to get them striving towards going into ecology conservation biology degrees later on you can't let them be <laughs> sounds bad but you need to um follow it through and make it normal at in those older years as well Mm, I think that's a really good point and something, as you mentioned, we sort of look at a lot of action for conservation too. Um, that's really interesting to sort of hear from yourself as well, Ellie. Uh, Sorrel? Yeah, I think what, what everyone said already is definitely uh, in agreement with what I think. Um, I definitely think there's a spectrum of uh, environmental organisations and how well they're engaging young people. I think the ones that are doing more are showing that this is kind of what's needed. Um, because, well, at the end of the day, how are organisations going to last if they're not engaging youth? And, and as, as Ellie said, it's not just about engaging young kids, it's about engaging um, teenagers and young adults, because uh, we're the ones that are going to be members of these societies and these organisations and working for them one day, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think, yeah, it's hugely important. I think with this work that we've kind of been exploring with YAP, we've seen how like there is a big need for this um, to engage more uh, people our age. 
Um, yeah, and with the social media thing, so yeah, as, as Ellie said, Twitter is a big thing in the birding world, but I don't know if it's such a big thing amongst young people in general. Um, so I think maybe there needs to be more of a, a crossover of social media with more Instagram and uh, things like that, that more young people are, are using. Not myself, but um, lots of young people do. Great. I've got a bit of a sort of a follow up question um, kind of relates to what you were saying, Ellie, um, on the question answer. So I want to ask, um, do you feel that the natural history GCSE will be a really positive step to bring nature learning more into schools? I know that will be at that that age group that you were talking about, Ellie, that might miss out on um, that nature connection. What are your thoughts on the natural history GCSE as being um, part of that? Um, I think, Ellie, you've unmuted yourself, so it'd be great to hear from you. (laughs) It's even it's uh, it's in a really uh, exciting step forward, I think, for everyone to hear that there is that motivation behind it and kind of realization of the value of learning about natural history now in school and making that more accessible. I feel like it does need a strong drive behind with teachers. Teachers are quite fundamental, I think, in schools, and you need that kind of inspiring um, lead. Because I know when I've done ecology or biodiversity at school, the teachers haven't particularly had a specialist interest in it or haven't really been um, motivated to teach it. So they've, they've normally just kind of put it on online courses or field trips and stuff like that. So I feel like it would need to be heavily supported to get the teachers to involve more people, but definitely it will reach a much wider audience, either, even like people just acknowledging it and knowing it and hearing about it talking about it is starting these conversations that get are getting going to get people outside enjoying Mm -hmm. nature getting more involved and so yeah it's definitely um an exciting step forward but definitely one that we're going to be interested to see how effective it is um arjun you've got your hand up yeah i've just i think i've just echoed a lot of what ellie said there and also i think well i think for me personally when i look at it i thought the natural history GCSE would be really good at keeping people already interested, already inspired in nature, almost uh, boosting their interests so they can, okay, yeah, they've got an opportunity to get more involved. Um, but at the same time, I think it will have a very specific target audience. I think education of slightly younger years, so maybe year seven, year eight, maybe year six as well, would, have, would be going forward even better because it would almost inspire more young people to get involved. Uh, last year, I think Bird Guides, who are a big organisation who released uh, uh, news about bird sightings, essentially, uh, they published a really interesting article saying that uh, from the ages around the 10 and 11, uh, that's when people lost interest uh, in nature because, I guess, changes, you're going from a different school, you're going for new friends, you're looking for new things to do. Uh, and I think that really showed to me that targeting that age and making sure that people from before maintain their interests would be really really important uh, and I think at the same time almost just linking to what I did see on the uh, Q&A as well when it comes to being cool that's such an important thing because I, I see birding as cool I see all my friends from bird all my birding friends are way cooler than I could ever be but I don't think many other people see birding as cool because they're just thinking what would other people see and I know from school experiences as well that bird watching isn't something that everyone's going to be thinking I wouldn't do that because it makes me cool and I think that's just where almost trying to change that as a perception of birding is going to be really important. But I think that through people that just go out and do it and say, this is really good, this is the kind of things that we can get up to, is just go, is going to change that a lot. Mm. Uh, thanks, Arjun. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I just want to add on to a bit of what Arjun said. I think well, I'm not particularly for or against it in any sense, to be honest. I think it could be good because... If people choose to do it, that could help sort of spark an interest. But I think one of the problems with it could be, like Arjun said, you know, I went to school in Essex, in Clacton. Birdings think of of an old person thing, a nerdy thing, um, stuff like that. That never bothered me. I just sort of just got on with it because I loved it and told everyone about it. But um, I think having it as a subject and almost like a sciencey type subject, would that push it even further that way into people thinking it as just being you know, as, as being a subject, as being sort of like something that you don't really want to do, that you sort of have to do to get through type thing. You know, birding and conservation for me is, is getting outside and that's where you get, that's where you get grabbed. That's where, you, that's where your interest really sparks. But that's probably just for me in general. So that's why I'm not against it. But 
I think there's could be better ways of getting people inspired. I think having someone stand in front of you and present you with passion and whatever is a lot better than some stuff written down on a piece of paper and a test. Thanks, Matt. Anyone else want to add into their thoughts of that, Sorrel? Yeah, kind of going on from that, um, I think the natural history GCSE would be really good if it's taught well, because um, I just remember doing uh, A-level biology and ecology in that. It just really wasn't inspiring. I, I knew I wanted to do it anyway, and I was kind of hoping that when I got to university, I would enjoy it, and thankfully I have. But um, it just really was, yeah, it just wasn't inspiring. We go out onto the field and, and look at quadrats of grass. Like, there's so much more of interest that would inspire young people and I think if those things are taught then if inspiring things are taught then yeah I think that natural history GCSE could do really good things but if it's not taught well and like the full potential of nature and birds isn't actually you know uh, uh what's the word like given to people then uh I just don't see it properly working hmm. um Sam and Vinnie do you want to add anything on to that yes Sam go for it yeah, so I think I think it's a really good idea, and I I honestly hope that it helps solve one of the problems. But and this is where I probably play a bit of a devil's advocate role here, and that's and that's the fact that if if there's obviously the possibility that only people that are already interested in wildlife will pick it. So I think actually that the natural history GCSE is a good start but I think that the learning needs to start further down in schools through probably from as early as reception or nursery or year one to that sort of age group because otherwise I don't see how you're going to get people into the natural history GCSE that wouldn't already come under that bubble if you like or come into fall into where we are um, so yeah. How would you see that sort of being introduced from such a young age would you see it as being an official topic or maybe something that runs throughout all of all of things like through maths through english how what do you have a thought on that or is it just sort of i mean let's get it in <laughs> i mean personally i think any any way of getting it into the curriculum is is a good way but i think it does need to be perhaps some sort of not i don't want to say like forcing people into it is not the right word but like it needs to be there so that there's at least an option when it comes to the natural G natural history GCSE that it can um, people are more likely to take it, especially if they've enjoyed that sort of thing. So whether it's simple things like a a bug hunting session or something like that, or pond dipping session once a week when you're in reception year one, year two, that sort of thing, and and then progressing that as you go through. I'm not sure, but yeah. Um, Vinny, anything to sort of wrap up the, the thoughts on the natural history GCSE? Um, I agree with Sam's point, honestly. While the kind of option of it would give it that reach that would kind of spark something in some people, not necessarily everybody, because it might be seen as kind of uncool or something like that. I think it really should start earlier mm. because that's where you really kind of grab people's attention and it's not kind of swayed by um, the norms of what you should do and what you can't do or what this or what's like favoured and what's not favoured. I think it should start somewhere between kind of year two, three-ish because that's where you'll really kind of um, grab the sort of um, attention of people really because there's not many people in year three who are kind of pressured into doing things that perhaps not many people would like to do mm. it's quite unbiased and I think it'd be a lot more effective fab and I think maybe Matt had his hand up so do you want to sort of wrap us up on the the topic of the GCSE yeah I was just going to add something a little bit sort of out there I was just going to say if we are going to teach people about natural history Let's take them to the East Coast in October and tell them that this little five gram gold crest has flown thousands of miles mm. to get here. And that's what can inspire people. That was just a little, a little. That's a really nice way of wrapping it up. Um, and thank you for that question from the audience. That was something I was also really interested in hearing your thoughts on. Um, the next question I'm going to sort of move us on to is um, around the barriers. And I know, Sorrel, you touched on this quite a lot in the presentation that you 
presented for us. Um, so it would just be great to hear sort of from your individual perspective um, and maybe from personal um um, experiences as well what the biggest barriers are preventing more young people from engaging in conservation um, including those from different backgrounds um, so does anyone want to start us off go for it Arjun <laughs> uh, yeah so I'll start off I think I'll talk about a little bit about diversity which I suspect Sorrel will want to carry on after I've uh, talked about this a little bit um, I think for, for me, I've, I'm, I've always been one of the few people from a minority background when I've been out bird watching. Often, I would say National Trust, that while they're amazing, that there are very few people from minority backgrounds uh, that volunteer with them. And it's not exactly a bad thing. It, I, I've always almost emphasised, because I've uh, discussed this a lot in my campaigning, and the idea of, I don't think it, it's because people are inherently kind of I know, racist or... Uh, anything like that and I think it's just trying to make it that more people from minority backgrounds want to get involved and I think bar one of barriers I'd say diversity which I'd say covers ethnicity age uh, gender and socioeconomic background I'd say those four things are really really important and all of the maps is barrier in different ways and I think organizations just trying to show that it's for everyone regardless of maybe not targeting one specific thing but showing it's for everyone uh, with everything they do, whether that's active volunteering opportunities or online things and saying you can do if it, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your origins are, you can get involved with this and here are the opportunities. I think that's where a barrier might be that it's just quite difficult to access some aspects of the environmental world. Um, and sort of to follow up on that, Arjun, for Amuba, um, you mentioned for organisations to show that it, that it is for everyone. Um, how would you suggest they might be able to sort of get that message across to the people um, that are coming to do their activities? Um, I think it's quite a difficult one because it's almost just saying we want everyone to get involved, but it can be as simple as just saying that every opportunity out there, there's no kind of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say prejudice against certain people, but just saying that we've got opportunities and we want to engage everyone in, in this. So if there's an open, kind of an open day kind of thing, saying, come along and we'll lead a bird walk just making sure that people know that they are welcome at things I think it could be that simple mm -hmm. um I'd say it, that would be in essence what I'd want to talk about but at the same time I'm sure there are a lot of different uh, other different ways that young people can get involved fab um does anyone want to sort of lead up from Arjun sorrow yeah, I'd just like to add, like, I think it's about representativity and, and seeing, as a young person, seeing yourself in the sector um, is really helpful if, if, you know, then you think you could get there yourself. Um, and same with, with people from minority backgrounds. Um, and, oh, that's what I was going to say. So, like, organisations supporting things like movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that, showing that um, these organisations want to be inclusive, I think, is a big thing. Um, and showing that they're not going to put up with any any kind of discrimination by any members or any um, uh, staff members or anything like that. Just just having really clear policies on it, I think, is really important. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's about representativity. Um, does anyone else want to add into what they think the biggest barriers are and any solutions? Who wants to go next? Matt, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm going to throw it another way. I'm going to go. Um, I, like the one that I talked about earlier was the sort of the nerdy sort of bird in perception uh, in sort of schools and in the communities. You know, I'm like I said earlier, I'm from Essex, Clapton. You know, you can't get any more sort of like un unburden related if you've tried. People don't go outside, etc. And um, you got to show like the youth advisory panel shows and our youth reps and all these people on social media and that. You got to show role models this is in a different sense of how you can get through that and how you can make it fun and how it can be so inspiring and why you want to get outside you you need someone to look up to i remember doing assemblies like year sevens and then seeing them walking on the seafront and asked me what i'd seen and that's just one tiny little step but that can be the, the start of them getting involved because they've actually you've sparked their interest a little bit and birding isn't just weird and a scope isn't a camera and they don't and they know what binoculars are you know what I mean? So it's, I, I think that is, in especially in Essex, that was the biggest barrier to you getting involved was people taking the mitt out. But it's all good fun for me. But it mm -hmm. might not be for anyone else. That might put you off. So 
that's a good point. Um, Sam, do you have something to add on to that or your own thoughts on barriers? Yeah, so I was, I was going to, I fully agree with both Sorrel and Arjun. And also I'm going to add on to something that Matt said as well. And that is the fact that um, effectively, I guess because nature is seen as this sort of not cool sort of thing and a bit nerdy, as, as Matt said, um, it can lead to quite intensive bullying in schools. And that that's, can be a big barrier for people trying to get involved. Um, I personally know people that were birders um, throughout sort of their early teens that gave up because they couldn't deal with the bullying anymore, which is not great. And uh, also, I know people on this call that nearly went that way as well. So um, it's it's worth bearing that in mind when trying to create these opportunities that there are there are going to be things that I don't. I, I, I find it difficult how we can overcome these sorts of things. And um, I mean, one of the ways you can do it is by creating a community, I guess. So building a community and having that sort of safe surrounding and knowing there are people that you can talk to if that sort of thing happens and knowing that you're not alone and trying to make birding as sort of as much of a community as possible and building up those relationships. Fab. I see lots of nods from the panel too. Um, Ellie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I think following on from what Sam said, I think in some senses it could be um, a job of kind of remodeling, rewording, rebranding, birding in a sense, because I think everyone's seen there's been so much um, movement behind the climate strikes and the school's climate strikes. And people want to get involved. People want to be stewards for the earth. People want to get into conservation. People want to save the rainforest. But I think it's relating that back and saying, actually, this is what I struggle with, especially with wildlife gardening at school, is you've got to relate that back to actually birding, monitoring bird populations is actually a really good way to show the ecological health of the planet mm. that we're developing. And I don't think always people can understand that link between perhaps birding, nature watching, all of this volunteering to the bigger picture that people want to act like they're doing something and contribute to these protests. So I think it's making sure that people understand that this is making a difference and that they can um, contribute and um, protect habitats and populations. I think on a bit of a side note as well, another barrier I think that Sorrel brought up as well is that um, travel and as a person who can't drive I, I heavily rely on the taxi of mum and dad <laughs> regrettably <laughs> to get me most places and that's quite hard because I feel quite guilty asking for lifts places especially as I started ringing now at like 6am in the morning you know I can't it's it's getting that uh, movement of um, independence, but also I think it's showing again that there are local places accessible that you can go to and, um, and you don't have to be um, an expert birder. Like, I'm not the most confident person. I won't be taking off a webs count all by myself straight away. Like, I would want a training. So I think People need to know that it's open to them, you know, and it's um, they can enjoy it as freely and not, it's not a, not a pressure thing at all. Hmm. Uh, I think Arjun might have something to add to that. Yeah, I think just leading on uh, to something like ringing, um, that kind of made me remember something about the BT, one of the BTO's big games at the moment, the online resources and just other resources with the equipment donation scheme because it can be really difficult to afford something to think. Like you, it's not it's not easy to get a hold of a good pair of binoculars when you're young. I saved up for a couple of years and I'm still saving up for new new camera and things like that. It's always saving quite a lot of money to get resources when it comes to bird watching and just nature in general. Something like ringing, it's not e easy to access the resources and I guess I've never got involved because I haven't got any local ringers. But that's another thing that barriers can include things such as resources and trying to get get it so then more young people can especially from backgrounds such as a lower uh, more disadvantaged backgrounds where it's harder to harder to get a hold of things such as binoculars or cameras trying to make it more accessible for those people and that's where i think just linking back to what we're doing at bto is really targeting one of those barriers uh, uh Vinny, how about yourself 
Um, I really think a big barrier, which some people have already said, is kind of the stigma around kind of birding being sort of uncool and you shouldn't do it when, in fact, it's really the opposite. I really like it. And I think we kind of need to support each other to kind of end this sort of idea that birding isn't what it is when it's a good way of kind of getting involved in conservation, not only from like, um, sorry, not only from an early age, but kind of throughout life as well. So I, th- I just really think we should be kind of supportive for each other mm. and um, it will be kind of a huge step forward in supporting con- conservation, yeah. Mm. I've actually had a really nice comment online um, to say that if teachers were giving classes, and I guess this maybe relates to the what you were saying about the GCSE, and had you all as guest presenters, um, then in, engaging younger younger classes um, would would really inspire them. Basically, so that's a really nice thing to hear. Um, you guys are very inspiring. Um, Matt, did you have something to add? I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that the barriers. We're talking about the barriers, but they don't have to be barriers at the same time. You know. We've all got the opportunity to try and break them down. Birding doesn't have to be enjoyed. You don't have to have a good pair of binoculars to enjoy birding. You don't have to go any further than your garden to see the birds in your garden and then watch migration or see insects and invertebrates. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we've got to tell people is that as much as you want them things, I wanted all them things when I was young as well. You don't need them to enjoy what is just out, out your back door. Anyone can do it. And I think that's the beauty of this hobby. Fab. Um, does anyone else have anything sort of to add to the barriers or any solutions that that you might want to put forward um, before we move on to the next one? Okay, I'll take silence as a good thing. Um, so my next question to you is, how do you see conservation playing into your life in the future? Obviously, you're all um, very active right now. Is this something that you want to continue with? How do you see that sort of playing playing out for you in the future? Um, and I'm going to throw it out there first off to Sam. I was hoping that wouldn't come to me first. <laughs> but um, No, it's all right. Um, well, I mean, it's 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 quite a good question because I'm not entirely sure. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm studying uh, ecology and wildlife conservation at university. And so in theory, that should mean that I will go straight into a conservation career. But um I don't think it's quite as simple as that because um, I mean, and by that, I mean, I mean, as much as I love doing research and stuff like that and doing wildlife surveys, um, I really do love getting involved with helping other people get involved with wildlife. So I'm not really entirely sure how, which route I'm going to take yet, whether it'll be research um, actually being like a warden reserve type thing or whether I'll go into some sort of more visit, visitor experience type role but yeah no it's um it's definitely going to be a big part of my future but I don't know how yet it's probably the correct way of putting it lots of sort of a broad option of range of options which is nice uh Vinny how about yourself um I think even if I'm not even in college now it will play um sort of a significant role in kind of what I choose to do in the future because I've been in, I've been interested in conservation since a long time and I want to do something like that but there's so many options that I don't know which one to choose and I think it's just um, down to me kind of making my mind up about what to do mm-hmm. and um, kind of what route I can take to get there so yeah uh ellie how about yourself yeah i think similar to sam it's quite a difficult question because i guess the beauty of being young is we don't quite know where we're going yet so (laughs) it's definitely gonna be um an interesting path i'm sure um but i know that because i think with the same with a lot of people once the connection with nature and and like conservation and natural world and that has been made I think it will be sustained and it will be carried on so even if we're not in directly conservation linked 
fields that we will always have that conservation mindset we'll also we'll be you know campaigning fighting for sustainability and you know all of this in whatever like um strand of work we go into whatever lifestyle whatever we choose I think it is something that will that is a value that will stay with us and that we will um hopefully inspire other people's other people to take on too amazing I might add into this question a little bit there's something um one of the questions that was sent in about what's your dream job um so maybe like how do you see yourself in the future and if there's a dream job um Sorrel how about yourself um kind of similar there's a lot of options um I know I want to work in conservation um but where exactly I'll end up I'm not sure yet it's quite nice knowing there's lots of different routes you could take I kind of plan on applying for everything and seeing where I end up um but the more sort of work we've done with YAP the more I've realized engagement is really rewarding um it's really fun um because I always thought I'd want to do ecological research bird research but actually like engaging other people is is incredibly rewarding um so I guess dream job is being able to kind of combine these and, and have an engagement role and um, get out and, and talk about nature all day as my as my job. <laughs> and I think you do great at it. <laughs> uh, Matt, how about you? Um, what's the future? Do you have a dream job? Well, I think the first thing I'll say is the day I'm not involved in burden or conservation will probably be a day that I'm sort of not ticking over anymore. <laughs> um, but no, I absolutely love it. So I'm probably quite lucky over this over sort of the last year or so literally until about a week or so ago when my contract finished I've been working at um Titchwell on the North Norfolk coast and on the Neen washes and I think one of the beauties there is you get to act on conservation in yourself so you know on the Neen washes we've got 75 percent of the UK's remaining black tailed goodwits and you and everything you're doing is helping to reverse decline in them species and trying to do your best to sort of get them back to to the best numbers possible and that's like everything you do on on the reserves and it's so rewarding i'm seeing it happen um i'd like so probably working on the reserve would be the best thing for me um i would love to eventually there's loads of reserves the reserves that i've already worked at like tit trial but absolutely i absolutely love working now i think it's the best thing um in the future would probably be a new reserve that is set up um to try and combat climate change in ways and sea level change and being the warden or the site manager of that reserve, I mean, how to arrange that from the first minute and seeing how your change can bring species in and increase them in the UK and sort of reverse the decline of some species and in increase the prospects of the future of others. You know, that must that is so rewarding to see the things which I go and watch in my free time. I then get to act on that. Um, and I've worked with little turns and stuff in the past. It, Yeah, like I say, the day I'm not in it, I won't be ticking over anymore. So yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah, a dream job, job is to do what you love. Um, Arjun, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to change the question a bit. So it's more to do with just the environment in general. Um, for me, I've always loved being outdoors and I'll agree with Matt. I think the day I accept an office job in the city, uh, basically the, the day my life starts to come to an end I think uh no I don't mean that seriously but <laughs> genuinely I just love being outdoors so the, the idea of working somewhere where I'm with nature all the time indirectly or directly just trying to research about the natural world is just what I love to do and I know that that's what I'll be going through into the future I think mm -hmm. for now like several others I, I do I do like the idea of keeping it open keeping the environment as almost a hobby at the moment uh, but that said, I'm about. I'm hoping to start geography at university next year. So from there, it will be trying to see where I branch out to. Uh, but I just know the environment will be heavily involved because I definitely have a passion for it, and I know that won't change. Mm, amazing. Um, so we've got a couple more questions on our different streams. And Yayan, feel free to jump in. I know he's also checking out the the different streams um, that we have. Um, but the first one I want to put to you is um, based around, I think it must have come from your uh, presentation at the beginning, Sorrel, um, so talking about YAP and the regional reps that you've brought in. Um, so what can regional reps do to support the youth reps? For example, are they going to be mentoring, leading walks, talks, etc.? Do you have sort of ideas in mind already for what they will be doing? Yes, or we'll go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so sort of our vision with the youth reps and, and the regional reps and how they'll support those roles is kind of through um, facilitating these events and 
getting young people um, uh, sort of facilitating those links between young people and the experts in their areas. So maybe local ringers, um, mm -hmm. yeah, providing training. I think there's a big um, sort of uh, market is the wrong word, but um, there's a need for lots of young people want training, identification help. Um, they want those skills and like to develop those skills and trying to do that on your own is hard work. So the regional reps could play a massive role there. Um, and also um, training young people to deliver training as well, I think is a really great way the regional reps could help um, to sort of spread the skills and um, spread the reach that way. Uh, Matt, go for it. Yeah, I think we want the regional reps, like Sora said in our vision, to work and the youth reps to work alongside each other. We were talking earlier about building that community, to really build that community within their county or their region. Um, to get more young people in and work them up through the system and get them doing BTO surveys and they can train them to then get the next generation inspired. So we want it to sort of spiral effects and build it into a really good community. So, yeah. Mm, so exciting. And when are they going to, I know they've just been bought on, I think, from what you were saying. Um, when are you hoping that they're going to begin um, their work in communities and sort of helping other people learn? Uh, does anyone want to take that in particular? Matt, go for it. I think the part of it is obviously, as you would imagine, is going into schools and doing stuff like that. So that's a bit COVID related. Um, but online presence and doing social media and making online content, as far as I'm aware, is starting sort of pretty soon. So we hope that should be coming as soon as possible, really. We've, we, like I say, we had the introduction meeting on Sunday. So the work starts now for them. <laughs> Fab. Um, there's another one that's quite interesting um, on the chat um, in terms of I know we spoke a little bit about social media before um, so we're quite interested to hear your thoughts on this one um, what are your th thoughts on bird watching through social media so people who enjoy learning about birds online sharing content about birds rather than getting outside uh, Arjun go for it I mean, I, I'd say although I've been birding for such a long time, I feel like everything changed really when I got onto Twitter. Uh, I, d I don't really remember why I first got it, but it was all of a sudden realising that in London I wasn't the only young birder out there. And I don't think I would have learned half as much as I did. I think before 2018, I knew practically nothing really. I just liked bird watching, but then all of a sudden being exposed to constant sightings and constant updates from other people especially young people who you also learn from quicker because it's easy to talk to them all of a sudden you're on group chats and whatsapp and on direct messages on twitter as well and i think that's where it is really good because everyone is so friendly on there that you do feel like you're part of a different community uh, and it's a very welcoming community that anyone is in, in, in i guess it's open to anyone uh, which is always really good uh, instagram is definitely getting better as well i think more people are almost getting braver on there uh, when I first got Instagram, I was like, I'm never going to be posting a single bird related thing on here ever. Uh, but I think uh, gradually I've managed to get myself a photography account, which was named photography, even though it's just bird watching stuff, just so that people didn't, you know. Uh, yeah, but I think that's where I'm just it's getting it's getting better, definitely. And I think Twitter is such an important community. But as Ellie mentioned earlier on, it, there is more to it than that with things like Facebook and Instagram that are both growing as well. Uh, it has so many different advantages. So I would say if you can encourage people to get, get themselves on social media, wherever it is, there will be people to learn from. So not just about getting outside, but also about sharing sharing things on social media and learning that way too. Um, Matt, you had something to add to that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think like Arjun said, I think Twitter is unbelievably good for getting people who, uh, like-minded people sort of involved and in con in uh, conversations of each other and sharing your sightings and inspires you to get out the door the next day and sort of chatting over identification and opportunities. Like I saw this opportunity to be on the Youth Advisory Panel on Twitter. So there's lots of stuff on there. I don't particularly do Instagram. My Instagram's more uh, pictures in Ibiza and stuff like that at the moment, not too much burden. And uh, But I wouldn't say... I'd say you can't just do it from inside. It's great on the other occasion to see a live stream or an identification video, but you really, to, to really feel the full effect, you've got to get outside to really understand the beauty of conservation and birding, I think. Amazing. Um, I'm going to throw it to a different question. We have a nice question that's come through on YouTube. Um, what is the most common bird that you feel like you should have seen, but they have eluded you? 
and everyone's having a, a good old think about that Sam go for it I'm gonna start but um there's there's other there's worse on the panel I can tell you that now mm. um for me it's got to be something like a grey partridge or um perhaps wood warbler or something like that never seen either of those two um no never seen long eared owl either there's a lot of species that i'd love to see that are just for some reason just have never managed to see gray partridge is a really bizarre one given there's tons of farmland just north of where i am and just yeah never managed to see one they see you come in and they hide <laughs> uh arjun how about yourself Oh, I know exactly who's asked this, and I know exactly <laughs> what they want me to say here. So this is this is uh, this is brilliant. But the the, the most convert I've not seen is the kitty wake. Uh, it's basically made me semi birding famous. I think if you could put it like that. Um, I've I've been to numerous places, and the first thing people have said to me is, "Oh, you've not seen a kitty wake? How have you managed that?" I think I've met people who I've never heard of before who have just been like, "Oh, you're the guy who hasn't seen a kitty wake." But <laughs> basically, it's just a small pretty boring girl that you see by the coast that basically everybody has seen and I haven't but yeah I'll get there eventually I feel like you shouldn't see it now seeing as it's made you famous <laughs> as soon as you see it that's it I'm expecting a viral tweet when I do see one <laughs> uh Sorrel how about yourself I was going to say, I don't think you uh, you should see one now. You've called it boring, Arjun. Um, <laughs> I think mine is Woodwalker as well, to be honest. And um, being in Scotland, I should have seen one um, by now. But hopefully next spring, maybe, if I'm allowed to go up and see some. Great. Uh, Ellie? I mean, I think there is probably many <laughs> to <laughs> from um, for mine. Um but one of the one of the most notable ones that I really want to see is like little owl and same as sound like long eared owl. They just they just obviously must hide whenever <laughs> we go looking for them. I, it's, it's one of those ones that are quite um, elusive to me at least. But yeah, I think that's the only thing. The part of birding which I'm not so fond on is kind of the competitive side of it, the bird, like the bird, the big long bird lists and life lists. And they're amazing to keep track of, but I think that it should be kind of kept quite um, casual. <laughs> and Matt. Yeah, well, he's probably just switched over to me. Yeah, I do like my list, like my British <laughs> list. I've sort of traveled over the country. Um, I've not seen some of the Scottish endemics. So Capacaley and well, you didn't get and uh, golden eagle and stuff like that. I can't think of many. There's there's quite there's quite a lot of birds, but they most of them have to be quite rare, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I've travelled all around the country. So it's mainly endemics at the moment. They're my only British breeding species I don't need. Very lucky. Um, and I think Vinny's just dropped off. Unfortunately, his uh, Wi-Fi must have gone. Um, Yayan's joined us, and I think he has a question for the panel. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, a question from the audience is, um, um, well, um, <laughs> I've come on now. Sorry, <laughs> it was about engaging young adults. So we've talked a lot about engaging school children and a little bit about secondary school children. Um, what about um, engaging uh, young adults, like say university students? Are there any projects or initiatives already running that um, help with engaging with that group? Thanks, so Sorrel. Go for it. Um, come to Sorrel. So. Uh, yeah, I think, well, this is partly what we want to tackle uh, with the youth advisory panel, um, connecting with more universities and more school age people. Um, but so fr from my experience, uh, we started up the Edinburgh University Ontological Society uh, just over a year ago. And it's actually, well, I kind of came to uni not knowing any, well, knowing one other birder. And then we met another birder and then we're like, right, let's try and set up a society. We'll see how it goes. And actually we built up to 35 members within two months. So I think it shows us definitely an appetite for um, birding societies at universities. And I think they can do a lot of, a lot of good work and um, getting more people involved. I know some people uh, from the society are now doing web counts and stuff like that. So it definitely shows um, connecting with university groups and sort of facilitating things through those networks that already exist um, is a really good, good way to go. Um, Unfortunately, the pandemic has stopped our events, but um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say on that. 
Thanks, Oral. I, th I think Matt wanted to add something too. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think there's university societies and groups that sort of come and visit some of the reserves and partake in sort of surveys and stuff like that as practice for some of their exams and stuff. So um, that's one way in sort of young adults can sort of get involved. As soon as you get them to a reserve, like I say, you can sort of you can get them ingrained in that community and get them involved and get them even more involved, get them back again. Um, so other than that, I'm not really sure, unfortunately. <laughs> Sam. Again, it, it, it comes to the uh, university society type things because um, I've been working with the Wildlife Conservation Society at Bournemouth Uni for the last two years, I think it is now. Um, and effectively in that time, we've managed to reach out to people. So it was m mainly based originally on our course, uh, which is the Ecology and Wildlife Conservation course. But since then, we've managed to bridge out and actually get people from law degrees, um, uh, English degrees, psychology degrees, all coming and joining because they have an interest in wildlife. And then once you've got that interest there, you can then jump on it and start to bring it into bird watching and stuff like that. So because they've got me on the committee, a lot of the events are sort of bird related. Um, don't can't really think why that would be, but um, no there's um there's a effectively that help that's helped a lot of people get involved and actually i think the more societies we get that are similar to that the more we can start to actually help people sort of find their i guess love of wildlife thanks sam i think ellie wanted yeah i think what like sorrel and sam has um shown is that young people are really good at inspiring each other and getting everyone to kind of join in and I think um there is scope as well um for other events to like ringing demos or going to bird observatories like I'm, I think Bangor has gone to Bardsey and places like that and I think uni is perhaps possibly a place where people are looking for a career or fields to more specialise in. So I think that's a good opportunity to kind of really um, expose people to those kind of branches of more specific kind of bird ecology and all of those um, types of activities. It can, as well as they got, um, I suppose, a really inspiring lecturer has a passion for it and that can really um, motivate them to perhaps more specific interest. Thanks, uh, uh, Matt wants to have, a, have another say. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, it was just uh, uh, just something that came into my mind that none of us have said and Sora talked about in their presentation was the mental health side for young adults. A lot of them have got exams and stuff like that and going outside and being surrounded by nature is not very much better for sort of, if you want half an hour to go and chill out and sort of see something and uh, just have a bit of a relaxing time outdoors and nature and conservation can surely come into that as well. Thanks, Matt. I think maybe we have a little bit of time left for maybe one or two questions. We've got one through on YouTube. Um, if young people don't have binoculars, is the iBird app something that could be used outside for IDing birds? And is it something that any of you have used before? Have you heard of the, the iBird app? Uh, Arjun, go for it. I mean, there are there are quite a lot of different apps, and I think broadening out, uh, uh, yeah, if you've broad the range from more than just bird watching, uh, you've also got iNaturalist, and then you've got eBird, and there are so many different apps that are very helpful for ID. And I think if you're trying to get into it, and you might not have the resources of something like loads of big books, or not necessarily having social media, I think a lot of people when they first get Twitter is a it's so useful just to say, see, I saw this bird, what is it? But then having an app to do that is really really good as well. Uh, so while I think it is really good, I definitely, I, I find there are limitations on just relying on my phone, especially sometimes when I, I don't have data or I don't know, I leave my phone off when I'm out there properly. So I, I generally find that uh, having a book or something like that is better. And I think Sam will probably agree because he does, uh, he uses his notebook all the time. Uh, and I, I would say having something like that is a lot better for like recording and identification than something on the phone but it's still really good and I think using technology is very important especially as it's available now. Thanks and Sam over to you. 
Yeah, I was just going to briefly, uh, well, agree with Arjun and then briefly add on with um, the, if, the basically um, there are some amazing apps out there that can help um, ID, but I think the broader ones are better because that can help people um, not just not just be inspired by birds, but inspired by other things and help to uh, identify other things as well. So um, the iNaturalist is a very good one and iRecord as well, I think is another one uh, mm. but no definitely definitely use those sorts of apps and it's really good Fab. and i'm going to close us off with one last question um that's on the question and answer um so bto has a new ceo juliet vickery what is your key message for her about how to further develop bto's youth engagement work over the next few years um so to close us off what are your what's your key message yes arjun yeah i'll start off and just say that saying in, in good I guess good connections with the with everyone involved at the at the BTO that are from younger generations, trying to see what we're up to all the time. And she showed that the other day by being on our call on Sunday Sunday afternoon uh, and taking such a direct interest in what we were doing, but almost keeping that going and really uh, keeping those links close with us and showing how much she does want to help. And I think that would be really important because there's no one who's got a better position to kind of show that BTO are interested in youth engagement down the CEO. And I think Matt had his hand up as well. Yeah, I was just going to go a bit more tangy. I was going to say, uh, give us some money to carry on <laughs> with our work and uh, and want and implement sort of our ideas and our priorities into, uh, into, into real life things. Nice. And um, lots of nodding heads. Sorrel, how about you? Anything to add? I think just making sure there's always a youth advisory panel from now on uh, with the BTO and, and um, having a nice revolving group of people going forever. I think keeping the youth rep scheme going forever, building on all of these things. Um, and then also sort of talking with other organizations about sort of the benefits of what we've done and maybe like developing this kind of work and then eventually building this big youth movement in conservation across all organizations. I think um, ambitious, but I think it's a good goal. Fab. Um, and if anyone has anything else to add, just give me a wave. Sam, go for it. I have to be very careful what I say because um, I'm, well, yeah, but um, effectively keep always have an open mind when going forwards with um, whether it's through the youth work and sort of have always listening to others and also working with other organisations closely because um. Yeah, no, I think it's really important, especially when it comes to youth work, that eventually working with other organisations would definitely help out um, going forwards. Amazing. And Ellie, anything to sort of wrap that up before we head over and wrap up the whole session? Yeah, I feel definitely like um, BTO should not neglect the youth engagement strategy that it's worked very hard to kind of build up and I think it um, should carry it on really well because I think we've created a good base to work from and I think as Sorrel said um, it's really important to branch out into other um, organisations and make sure there is that support for that transition perhaps from because um, I think we've shown that there are clear paths between going from BTO Bird Camp to the YAP and then doing like webs counts and getting involved I think showing that there is that kind of pathway through the organization and that there is a an end goal is really important and I think more and more so I've been shown that there are me like more than I could ever have thought of people in young people interested in birding and people want to know what's going on people want to be involved they want to they want to have a say they want to contribute so I think making sure that um, we're, we're in the know-how, we're, we're kind of made sure that we're thought of and being put into these kind of plans so we're, ke so we're kept involved is quite important but yeah onwards and upwards hopefully. Amazing and uh, just a really big thank you um, from me um, for inviting me here today and you guys are incredible uh, and really inspiring um, so I'll pass over to Yaren so we can wrap up so we're not over time. <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, thanks so much Emma and thanks to the whole panel. I spend the whole of that time with a massive smile on my face because um, as I do every time I engage with you all, you know, you're also inspiring. Your stories are fantastic and you just give so much, you just nail it every time. 
Uh, so I'll just summarise and say, I, I think we've heard so much about the importance of parents and grandparents and teachers and uh, other mentors too, lots of whom are probably uh, listening tonight or watching tonight, uh, not least to be the taxis to get uh, the young people to the places they need to go. Uh, we've heard the importance of engaging young people at a very young age, but also um, of the challenges of maintaining that engagement through secondary school. We heard really loudly about the importance of engaging young people with inspiring experiences outside, you know, real experiences. And I suspect that many of us can sympathise with Sorrel and her um, experience of uh, looking at quadrats of grass. Um, no offence to any of the botanists uh, or teachers watching. I absolutely loved Matt's idea of taking young people to the coast in October to see uh, gold crests just newly arrived from uh, Scandinavia. I think a lot of what you talked about tonight in terms of the barriers uh, and the opportunities uh, chimed with the market research the youth panel have done and that has informed the strategy that we're going to be uh, receiving at the board on Friday. I think, you know, it's clear to me that we really do need to work harder to remove the barriers to young people engaging with nature and conservation and for organisations like BTO uh, to step up and do more um, for our harder to reach communities. And you talked about the importance of having, you know, representation at all levels. I'm really pleased to say that, that that's a frequent topic of conversation at BTO now, but we do need to move much quicker, I think, from talking about these things to actually putting them into action. Most importantly for me tonight is that we've listened to the experiences and, and views of you, uh, you know, the young people who are engaged with us, and we need to continue to listen and learn if we're going to have a future where more young people feel like there is a place for them in science and nature and conservation. I hope all of you watching have enjoyed the discussion as much as I have. I want to thank um, Action for Conservation um, for uh, loaning us Emma and Vinnie and all the panellists for their contributions too. Also all of you for giving up your time to uh, watch and to participate in the discussion. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions but I hope we got through a fair few of them. As I mentioned at the start, um, you know, now more than ever our work relies on, on the support of, of you because of the impact of the pandemic. There are lots of ways uh, that you can support us and I know that many of you do support us uh, already. Uh, if you can uh, give a donation, you can do so to our youth engagement work by following uh, the link on our screen now. This is in the end, of course, there's lots more opportunities to join us this week. Um, the next session in our virtual conference takes place tomorrow at two o'clock when we'll be uh, hearing about what 25 years of Garden Bird Watch has taught us. Uh, how we can keep our garden wildlife healthy and we'll be hearing some exciting new research uh, tracking Britain's wintering black caps. Until then or until the next time we meet uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh, have a good evening. Do we go now? Hi guys. Hi Ian. I was just yeah, about to start you? playing uh, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> should I go now? Have we stopped Steve? Yes, I think we have. Maybe William can just confirm.